Astrophotography is a fantastic hobby and it's made all the more rewarding by the difficulties that you overcome in order to make a great image. These are some of the images that I've taken over the years using a variety of programs and in this series of videos I'm going to take you through my favourite which is Sequence Generator Pro and how to get the best out of it. My name's Chris Woodhouse and I'm the author of several books on astrophotography and this series of videos is going to take a look at setting up Sequence Generator Pro and using it in anger. Sequence Generator Pro or SGP as I'm going to call it from now on, which is less of a mouthful, is a very interesting program. It started life as a front end to another um, imaging program called Nebulosity and then developed into a full-blown um, acquisition program in its own right. The developers are very responsive. It's gone through a number of beta versions in the recent months. I'm using a version that was published in the middle of December 2019 and by the time this uh, hits the, the web there may be another beta version out there. The user group is very proactive, they make lots of good suggestions, some of which are implemented, and also the program itself is quite clever in so much that it tries not to, to deviate into areas which uh, are not its strength and confuse the interface by having too many buttons and options. When you first power up SGP it typically looks like this with a um, something called a sequencer window on the front here uh, with not much in it and behind it there may be some windows around the outside and some ones in the middle. These things here um, typically get in the way of image area which is this grey area in the background and I normally park these to the sides of the screen especially if I'm using a laptop. There's a clever way to do this um, to minimise uh, their space, I group them together in like-sized dialogues. If you can see, that's very similar in size to this temperature one. So if I drag it onto here, it becomes a tab of this one. And then if I drag this as a group, I can either drag it on top and make it as a tab on this, or put it above it and it inserts it above. So I'm going to put this one on top of here by dragging it onto the tab and the focus control I'm equally going to drag it onto here and make it a tab. So in this case I've got two tabs frame and focus and temperature and I've got focus sequence and target information and I've got general information about my observatory and the weather and on this side I've got some scope controls and uh, some image history information and I've got filter wheel control and uh, the guider graph and at the top of here I've got stuff about the image that's on the screen uh, image statistics and the histogram of the image. So these windows are useful in providing data and also in some cases uh, implementing actions or changing something. The middle area is used for where the image comes up so what we're going to do is just take a look generally at what we have within SGP. So we have, as I mentioned before, these little dialog boxes around the outside which allow me to control and monitor what's going on. I equally have a couple of windows that don't normally appear all the time and they are typically something called the control panel which gives you an instant view of your equipment and its setup and the sequencer window which gives you information about the target, the equipment that's being used, how you're recording the data and where you are imaging from, and the actual exposure plan, which is based on exposure times, filters used, uh, how many times you want to repeat, and so on. We'll come on to each of these in, in their own time, but for now what I want to do is just take you through some principles and the principles of creating a sequence in the most reliable way. In common with some other programs, the best way of creating a sequence is to build on a foundation, and that foundation is based on the equipment that you have. And there's something in the tools section called the Equipment Profile Manager and the User Profile Manager. Let's do the user one first, that's the simplest. 
And this basically says, where are you? What your name is? What the site name is? And its longitude and latitude and elevation and your local site horizon. And you can check this little box here. It says use profile as default for new sequences. And you can create a number of these. You know, you might go to a dark field site or, or go on holiday and you can create a number of different sites and, and flip between them. That's the easy one. The more complicated one is the Equipment Profile Manager. And this specifies um, in savable um, configuration files what your equipment is and how it's set up. So for instance, at the moment I'm using this configuration. I'm using a QHY CMOS camera and it does have a filter wheel, even though it's a colour camera. I have a, a focuser motor. Um, I'm using the SkyX as a telescope driver. I am plate solving it to allow me to centre the image accurately. I am auto guiding it with PHD2 and I have some other things including a roll off roof observatory. And what I can do is say, click on that button there and say use profile as default and hit save and now any time I create a brand new sequence it will adopt all these settings and I don't have to enter them in manually. So I'm just going to hit OK to take that away, go back to my sequencer window and you'll note that confusingly in some regards I can also select equipment down here. Now there's nothing stopping you doing this and dynamically changing your equipment and it's sometimes useful for a quick and dirty experiment but you just have to remember that each time you generate a sequence you're going to have to select your equipment manually. So it's better to do it with a saved configuration and then you can just pull on that, know it's reliable and all set up correctly. There's two little boxes next to each of these. The spanner brings up properties of the camera and this is the connect button. So I'm just going to shut that down for a second and look at something else. There's some other configurations that are generic. Uh, you'll find them in the Tools section and you have uh, options at the bottom here. And you have general options about how you want SGP to behave, including how you want to define your file names. Uh, so for instance, you can set up an automatic file naming system that uses the name of the target, the date, the, the time of day, what filters used, exposure times and so on. And there's a key to all the different parameters you can put in the file name so that on a glance you can work out what you're looking at. There are other things here. For instance, there's a screen stretch. It doesn't affect the actual image data and you have either low, medium, high as default and you also have some things about how it finds stars and works out the star sizes. When I first um, start up, I want to um, autosave my sequence, load the last sequence when I start up, uh, prompt import filter wheel data, and show beta releases when checking for updates. Typically, you get new features on beta releases before they, they hit the mainstream um, uh, releases. Sequence options. Again, some more generic options. A number of events, typically six. I have a, a five filter filter wheel at the moment. I can do delays before and after exposures. And a few things about recovery. One of the great things about SGP is it's able to stop and restart an image based on conditions becoming bad and, and better again. And this defines how you want to do it. So for instance, if it fails, it can try to do the next target. Um, you can restart a sequence when the conditions are safe. There's a, a warning message that's optional. You can also run calibration frames even if the sequence fails to complete, which is handy, rather than leaving you in the lurch. That's typically about flat frames, which can be different from one night to the next. And you can automatically recover the sequence over a period of time. So I basically try to recover it every 10 minutes over a 90 minute period and after that it says enough's enough and, and, and goes to sleep. So there are other things here. There's a notification system that comes up and just tells you and gives you warnings or it can give you information that you've just completed an image. And there's also a, an, an actual notification system um, which 
uh, can send you text messages or emails based on certain conditions. So if I click on external apps, this is where you set up how it does things in regard to external applications. So I'm using a PHT, PHT, PHD2, sorry, a bit of a tongue twister, uh, for guiding, which is a popular one. I also have uh, a pinpoint plate solver, so it's not set up here. So if I do browse and set the directory for the actual, um, the actual catalog, so it's in my documents. So it's that one there. And that, now it will be able to work properly. And I'm using a, a new plate solver at the moment, which is a freebie called ASTAP, which seems to be very effective and typically runs faster than Pinpoint. So I can hit OK now. There's one other little thing I just forgot to mention for new, for new users. Um, if I just go into the options, there's something called Show Tooltip Help when hovering over controls. So if I click on that and then click on something else, um, let's see. Uh, so it comes up with a little dialogue that explains what's happening. Um, for the purposes of the video, that can get in the way of what I'm trying to describe. So for the moment, I'm actually going to disable that. But it's useful if you want reminding what something's for. So I'm just going to pause there for a second to get some, my breath back. It's one thing to write a book and something else to speak without hesitation, deviation or repetition on a video. So I'm just going to take a glass of water and come back to you in a few seconds. OK, that's better. There's a couple of things on the screen that I need to point out that are useful to understand. So along the bottom here, you often get notifications of what it's doing, um, what, what the next step is, and you also have some information about the sequence itself. And when a sequence is running, it basically gives you an idea of what options you've set and things like the amount of time to a meridian flip or the time to the, uh, the target start and things such as that. You also have two buttons at the side here which talk about safety and recovery. So when you connect uh, a weather system to SGP, it can, for instance, look for um, safe conditions from cloud cover or rain. And also this green button here says that recovery will be active. If you've been used to using a, a normal DSLR, you, you see an image that looks fairly good on the screen to start with. If I just open a typical image, this was one I was doing earlier, it comes up into the middle section and it basically looks black. If you look very carefully, there's a few white dots and that corresponds to the stars. And you can see in the image information that the histogram shows all the information is in the dark tones. And in the image statistics box, although there's a couple of peak values that are clipping, which is where these white stars are, the mean value is very low. There are a couple of ways of looking at this image. You can stretch it so it'll use the default stretch size, which is medium or low. I can also stretch that more by right clicking and hitting auto stretch high. And that shows there's a little bit of clipping on the corners of the filter now, which is uh, not unexpected because it's a, um, a small filter in front of a big sensor. The other thing you can do is you can look at the general star sizes. So if you click on here, it will calculate the star sizes and it will populate it here. So it says the half flux radius, average half flux radius of 300 stars is 3.45. And in a sequence, it will show this information here. So if I just open an, an, an old sequence like this one here, oops, this, ah, when you create a sequence, uh, when you try to open a new one, it asks you to save the old one. So I don't really want to save the old one because it hasn't got anything in it. So just cancel that for a second. And if I click here, there's a number of different events. And it's, if I click on an event, it shows me the history of the star radius as, it, as it, each frame came in, and also the number of stars it saw. So it saw 243 stars here, and it got up to 
just get it right. It's a little bit finickety. Okay, it's 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 250 stars ish all the all the way. But you can see that the focusing slowly getting worse um, as time goes by, and typically what happens is you auto focus before that starts becoming too bad. The other thing to to note in the history is that when you stretch an image, so if I just bring in that image again, the histograms look identical when you haven't stretched it. When you stretch it, the, the histogram that this is the, the stretched one and this is the, the actual image one. You can also manually move this about and if you want the same level of stretch for every image you can just do lock range and that will automatically apply a stretch just to the screen image, not to the file on every image, which allows you to see what's happening. A couple of other things along the top which allows you to see what's happening too is you can invert the image. If you're doing a dim nebula, it's sometimes useful to invert an image. So let me just open something up. Let's pull up something else. So this is uh, the heart nebula which is mostly nebulosity. If I stretch it, you can't really see the nebula, but if I invert it, um, it's still quite difficult to see. Let's do a medium stretch. You can start to see there's a little bit of nebula here, and there's, there's some nebula around here. There's a sort of dark blob here. Very faint, but it's easy to detect in an inverted image than a positive one. You can also put on a crosshair if you want to center a star. You can see the information that's being recorded with the file, which shows the FITS header, and you can scroll down there. The other thing you can do is you can rotate the image, which is useful, and you can flip it. You can also um, fit to screen, or you can scale it. So for instance, I can zoom to a particular percentage, which is handy, or I can do fit to screen when you want to see that the whole framing's good and there's some zoom controls. And here, there's something called the, the mark image bad or the thumbs down button. When you're running a sequence and you see an image come up and it's horrendous, um, maybe a, a plain um, vapor trail went across the image at the time, if you hit that button, it will rename the file as bad and if the sequence is running, it will actually decrement the sequence counter and it will retake the image, which is useful. So you won't lose an image as such, it'll just carry on a bit longer. So I'm just going to take a pause there and then when we come back we're going to look at setting up the sequence um, profiles in anger and how to do that properly. And that's probably best done in a new video. So in part two we're going to look at equipment and user profiles. So thanks for watching and hopefully see you in part two.